You know, the, the case for electric, um, it, it, again, this is kind of what gets us here. This is where a lot of the initiative comes from, is, you know, the zero emissions and greenhouse gases. Um, noise pollution, obviously, is, is, is a part of this. Um, and self-admittedly, I, I really didn't think of it a lot until I got into this um, and started on my demo tour. And, you know, you just start to get into situations where you realize, okay, I'm doing this task and now there's no noise. And it does become a more pleasurable experience for the most part. So um, that, is a, that is a really big benefit of electric vehicles. One of the things, obviously, that we talk about is, uh, is uh, greenhouse gas emissions and reductions and the, and the uh, EPA side of things. So if we if we start with a fire truck that's going to last 17 years, and that 17 years comes from the FEMA uh, documentation where they went out and, and surveyed uh, several years ago and said how long does a uh, uh, apparatus last in frontline service, and 17 years was that average average amount. So if we assume an, a 17 year average life, then somewhere around 425 tons of of CO2 would be saved um, by adopting, uh, for, one, for one truck, by adopting one, one electric truck over a diesel. NFPA talks about uh, not wanting firefighters around exhaust gases coming out uh, from, from tailpipes emissions, and that's one thing that goes away almost entirely uh, with electrification. Uh, the health and wellness thing, um, and then uh, if, if you're from California, uh, that's, that's obviously a big thing too, is that they're just saying, well, you know, by a certain period of time here, I think it's, is it 2035 or 2030? Um, they're just, uh, everything's gonna have to be electrified at some point in time. And then if you look at NFPA 1500, which is the health and wellness uh, standard, uh, they talk all, a lot about uh, exhaust emissions and um, so there's, there's all those standards to consider also when you're thinking about uh, you know, potential p benefits of electrification. Starting for uh, apparatus contracted for after January 1st, 2024, it's, uh, it goes to NFPA 1900. We wrote some uh, safety things into uh, 1900 for, for electric fire apparatus. Uh, but then we also went through and and made sure that an electric apparatus is allowed for NFPA because you think of the, the current NFPA 1901 standard says something like, oh, you've got to have an alternator. Well, there is no alternator in an electric fire truck. So there are things like that that were specific to internal combustion engines. Um, and we were able to say, all right, well, if you have an internal combustion engine, it has to do this. If it's an ele electric fire truck, then it, uh, then it does that. And my anticipation is that in the, uh, the next revision to come, by that time we'll have a lot more experience with this and uh, we'll probably be adding more things into that that, that will ensure, uh, ensure safety from a standardized standpoint. One of the big benefits is, is the reduction of noise. So for most of the time, in, and if we look at what a fire truck does, you know, 90% or better is non-pumping operations. And of course, when you're not pumping, that's when you know, that's when all that noise is gone. And it sounds, for the most part, like this. I mean, it's just very quiet and it's very pleasant. Um, you know, we often talk about decision making. You know, Roger and I, we sit in a lot of meetings and it's a nice, calm environment and we can think clearly and we can make decisions pretty easily. Well, sometimes, I guess, but. <laughs> Compared to if you look at a firefighter's role, you know, all this, you know, they're out in the thick of it, right? And there's a lot of chaos and commotion going on. And, and you guys are making, you know, sometimes life and death decisions. And if that noise is greatly elevated, it's not that you can't make the decision, but you can think a lot more clearly when that noise level is reduced. So it is one big benefit to the electric vehicles. And so that's both in, you know, in response mode as, as well as when you're on scene. So we'll kind of get into each and one of these, each one of these here a little bit. So just the operational benefits. So there's there's certainly the fuel savings, and we'll chat about that. We got some data from uh, from LA we'll look at, uh, but then just the ongoing um, regular maintenance that you would do on you know an hourly or annual basis. To look at the operational benefit, that you'd start with fuel, right? So there's fuel from idling that you're gonna you're gonna save, and again we're working this off of that 17 uh, year old or that the truck that's going to be in service for 17 years and uh, we come up with around $6,500 of diesel fuel savings 
per year just from idling. Then if you look at it from driving, you got another 5,500 or so uh, dollars. Again, it has everything to do with where the diesel price is. So this is obviously going to vary from department to department. I mean, and this is another thing that I tell people, if you're running four or five calls a day, it's gonna take a really long time to get that ROI compared to a department that's running more like 15 to 20 calls a day. So it's, it's not just looking at you know, the upfront cost of the apparatus, you really do have to look at the total cost of the ownership. Uh, what is it going to cost me to operate that vehicle over the life, uh, whether it's you know, the 17 years that uh, FEMA and NFPA talk about, sometimes it's gonna be shorter than that and sometimes it might be longer than that. So obviously there's gonna be very few oil changes with an electric vehicle. Um, that said, um, both are actually all three of the electric vehicles uh, on the market right now. Uh, they still do have a diesel engine in them and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but the fact is the hour consumption or the hour usage on these diesel engines is gonna be so low that you'll probably, you'll never hit the hours in a year. Um, you might still do an oil change uh, once a year, but the big difference is, is uh, now I'm changing the oil on you know, anywhere from a three liter to a six liter engine compared to a, a 12 or 15. So um, that preventative maintenance is gonna be uh, a lot less uh, costly. And the architecture on the electric vehicles is, is different between all three of them. So uh, we still do, um, at least on our vehicle, we do have a, a kind of a two-speed transmission, but the maintenance, uh, again, is gonna be a lot less than what we're used to on the Allison. So um, depending on, again, the number of calls you're running, so somewhere in the area of you know, $3,000 a year in savings just on transmission oil changes. One of the big things that everybody is gonna gain from is uh, less DPF uh, regeneration, ash cleanings, um, those things that you know came into us with the 2007 and then 2010 EPA uh, changes to the engines, and uh, most of that pretty much goes away because you're just not going to be using these these engines very much at all. And I think the main thing that we all know this is the thing that kills um, the DPFs is idling. Um, and in pretty much all of our cases, the difference is is when we are running that diesel, we're running it at a load. So it's very seldom that that engine is idling, which is, that's what causes most of our issues on today's diesel apparatus. So here's just the um, sort of summary of all of the savings. You come up with, uh, uh, you know, around a quarter million dollars potentially in diesel, uh, and expenses saved over a diesel apparatus. Obviously, you've got to pay for electricity, and we went out and did some, uh, some got some numbers uh, out, of, out there off of the utilities. Um, so if you subtract what you um, are going to spend on electric, maybe you come out with a couple of hundred thousand dollars in, in operational cost savings over life of the vehicle. In the case of Los Angeles, so they're, they're going through several different testing periods. And in the first testing period, which was about 26 weeks, it started uh, September of last year, went through March, they responded to just shy of 1,500 calls, so 1,482 calls. Uh, with their truck. They drove 3,798 miles total operating time, which basically means any time that truck was powered on, uh, whether it was using uh, electric operation or diesel operation, was 1,185 hours. But they had, in that first six months, they had uh, 53 calls where they engaged the pump. Depending on what you're doing, once the batteries get to roughly 20%, um, this backup diesel will automatically engage. and in both of our cases, it starts recharging the batteries. Both of our vehicles, and we'll get into architecture a little bit, they are only driven by electric motors. So in the case of this diesel running, it's only engaging, um, recharging the batteries, and in some cases, running the pump. So that was roughly 16 hours. They were maybe doing some extended operations from training, just uh, early in-service training. And so they used 22 gallons of fu diesel fuel in those first uh, six months. So not very much. The latest kind of average I've seen was about 5.25 a gallon. Um, so their estimated fuel savings um, compared to their diesel apparatus, which they were running through around 15 gallons a day. So in those first six months, they saved somewhere around $9,600. So if you look at all that, roughly 98.6% of all of those runs 
were run on electric operation only. And we'll kind of get into extended operations here in a little bit. We have year two estimated, which will kind of be their first full year uh, in service. It depends on fuel prices, but they think they'll be somewhere around $24,000 a year in fuel savings. If they leave the station at 100%. Um, they're typically driving a couple miles to the scene. They're on scene for 15, 20 minutes. It's usually a medical call or you know, perhaps a false alarm, something like that. And then they drive back to the station. That's so taken somewhere around, maybe on the low side, 8% of the battery, high side, maybe 15%. It really just depends on how far it is away and how they're driving to get there. Not all electric vehicles are, are created equally. There's different architectures. Both. Um, uh, the Rev Groups and, and Rosenbauer fall into this category here, and we call it a range extended electric vehicle. And as I just mentioned, both of the vehicles to get from point A to point B, the only thing propelling that vehicle is the electric motors. We do have a backup diesel, but it is only recharging the batteries. When we talk about, you'll hear us talk about, you know, the vehicle's 100% electric, and this is really what we mean is the vehicle is going to respond on electric, it's going to pump on electric, it's going to operate at scene on electric, and it's going to return to the station electric. So you'll, you'll see a lot of terminology thrown around out there, but when we say 100% electric, that's really what we're talking about. So we'll go through a few of the different uh, brands out there. First one we're going to talk about is the Pierce Volterra. Uh, this is right off of their website, so you can see the, the architecture there is a, a diesel engine. It's a common 6B, uh, 6.7 liter. Um, behind there, they have a proprietary transmission, and inside that transmission um, is, are some electric motors embedded inside the, the transmission. Um, and then there's a drive shaft back to the, to the pump, and then from the pump back to the, to the rear axle. So it's very similar in, uh, to a typical diesel fire apparatus other than the fact that it's got these electric motors buried inside of their um, electromechanical transmission. So they're going to be able to do some pumping on electric, they're gonna be able to do some driving on electric, they're gonna be do, doing some pumping and driving on both at the same time. So this is the RTX, and um, as I mentioned, so right now the only thing driving this would be the two electric motors. So if you look at this uh, image over here, so we have an electric motor right there, and we also have another one right there. Uh, running on two separate battery, or two batteries, so we got the one horizontal and the one vertical right there. So once my batteries get low, it's gonna go through this transfer case and it's gonna spin the pump off of this diesel. Any reserve power uh, will actually go into this electric motor and it will we'll use that electric motor to send energy back into the batteries. So this is a little 3D animation we have that kind of does a good job of explaining this. And it's very similar for both uh, Roger and, and our product. So in this case, it's electric driving. So you can see energy leaving the batteries and going into the drive motors. So there you can see my diesel is started up. I am sending, um, sending power into this generator. It's refilling my batteries but I'm also driving. Regenerative braking, uh, let your foot off the accelerator. Uh, that basically electric brake is going to engage and it is sending energy back into the batteries. So then we get into electric pumping. Generator becomes my electric motor, sending energy down to my pump. I got water coming in and out and my batteries are depleting. And then the last one is pump operation off the diesel. So there you can see my diesel is running. I got my pump running, water's going in and out and my batteries are charging. Let's just say I'm coming back from a long call and I'm pulling into my station, I'm at 20%. And I'm, I'm getting back there, I'm just getting ready to plug in and we get another fire. The driver gets in the truck, puts it in a drive and he just goes. It's automatically gonna start up the diesel. It's gonna produce more power than you can consume. And then any, any reserve capacity that is not being used by the drive system or the diesel or the uh, the pump will go into that generator and recharge the batteries. So even as you're driving to the scene, you're still going to see that battery um, level going up. Maybe not a lot, but you will see it start to go up. So the architecture on 
on the vector, you can see the green uh, battery packs in the back. There's three of them. There, there, yep, one in the back. And they're all identical. Uh, each one of them is 109 kilowatt hours of, of power, so you end up with about 327 kilowatt hours altogether. Cummins engine in the front, that 6.7 liter B-series engine, it's the same one that we talked about in the Volterra, except uh, in this design, the only thing it's doing is running uh, a generator. So it's, it's just like a, it's like a big generator on the truck. There's no drive shaft at all back to, to either the pump or the rear axle. So the only way the truck can operate is uh, by, via the electric motor. Electric motor is located just in front of the pump. So you've got a short drive shaft between the motor and the pump, and then another drive shaft between the pump and the rear axle. And from there on back, it operates just like a, a typical diesel pumper would. Picture here of the, of the drivetrain. So you can see that uh, very large uh, electric uh, drive motor. That's a synchronous AC motor. It's got about 12 phases of AC power coming to it from the inverters. And that's what either drives the pump or drives the rear axle. Whenever I need that diesel engine for a backup, it is running at a load. And so if we, if we look at today's apparatus is what kills them is the idling. So um, as far as you know, I, I've had our truck on the road for 15,000 miles. It hasn't regened once yet. Um, and now part of that is, you know, we've been driving all around uh, North America and there's not charging stations. So in order to get from department to department, we're pretty much running that diesel nonstop. That's how we're charging it to get, uh, get across the country. I would say the same thing in our case too, is I spent a lot of time in it whenever I was driving across state. You just turn the range extender on and just leave her run the whole time. Um, and it's, uh, it, it goes right to 1750 RPM and stays there the entire time, um, even, even when you're at stop signs. So running the range extender in an urban environment, you don't want to do that. You want to be all on electric, right? And, and it's very pleasant then, but when you pull up to a stop sign or, or you know, you expect that engine usually to drop down. And in this case, it doesn't. It just stays at that 1750 and continues to, uh, to, um, to provide power until, in our case, if you get up to the, a 90% state of charge, the engine comes off automatically. It just, and then you run on electric till you get down to 80, and then it comes back on again and, on, and back and forth in the manual charge mode. In the automatic charge mode, it's, it's going to go all the way down to 15. Um, uh, Todd was talking about a 20% state of charge. In our design, it's 15% state of charge. The, the range extender will come on. It'll go up to 50% state of charge and then shut off. You'll op operate on electric back down to 15 and you just keep cycling that um, if you're in, this, in a condition when, where you would need to use it. There's really two methods of uh, putting together a lithium, uh, lithium battery today. Uh, one of them is the cylindrical cells. There's actually, there's actually three, but we're going to focus on these two. Cylindrical cells like, um, like Tesla uses and uh, pouch cells. Uh, the two systems are chemically the same. Uh, you, you start out with a, a layer of um, an anode, a cathode, and then an electrolyte in between. And those are going to be composed of uh, like a usually silicone or carbon on one side, and then you got the electrolyte, and then you got on the other side you have um, the NMCA, so it's the nickel metal, uh, nickel manganese cobalt uh, alloy. And then you have the, the ions that the lithium ions are suspended inside the electrolyte. And so when you're charging, you're pushing those little guys from one side to the other, and when you're discharging, they're coming back again, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's how a lithium ion, um, battery works. If you're using a cylindrical uh, technology, you just take that and roll it up like a jelly roll. If you're using a pouch technology, they're just leaving them flat. And so inside our, our product, you have those battery packs, or you just start stacking those, those pouches up. And chemically, each one of those pouches is good for 3.2 volts when they're discharged, and 4.2 volts when they're fully charged. Um, and you just stack each one of them into what they call a brick. And then that brick, in our case, is about 15 volts a piece. And then you put enough bricks together until you get 800 volts, which is what we're running. Are you guys... I don't remember. We're 650, I believe. 650? Yeah. Okay. And if you look at the cars out there on the road, they'll go anywhere from 250 volts. A lot of them are around that 400, 450 volt 
uh, stage right now. Um, and then there are some that are up around, around 800. To extend the battery life, what you don't want to do is ever fully charge them. So as a designer, we don't even allow the operator to use all of the battery. So when it says 100% on, the, on the, uh, the dash, what that really means in our case is, it, is 88%. Now, you don't ever see the 88%, that's behind the, the scenes, but we never let you charge all the way. We also don't let you discharge below 8%. So we're using that 8 to 88% window in the middle, which helps extend that, that battery life to begin with. You can also do things as an operator to say, you know what, uh, during, during my operations, I'm starting out at 100% and I go down to 80, I come back to the station, I plug in and I go back up to 100 all the time. I don't really need to be living at 100 all the time. I've learned that I can live very nicely at 80. That's probably what you want to do then. And you can, you can uh, set, I'm assuming you guys do the same thing. We have a charge limit. You can say, hey, I want to only charge to 75 or 80 or 85 or 95 or 100. I can pick that charge level I want so I can extend the battery life meaning the long-term battery life, by, by setting that charge limit somewhat something below 100%. We're both turning the range extender on between 15 and 20%, so the batteries are never going to see their uh, get down until they're fully di discharged either. So we're being really kind to these batteries, and so when we worry about, hey, how many years is, am I going to have before I need to change them out, we're, we're uh, being nice to them about how much power that we're drawing. We're, we also have battery thermal management system that's gonna keep them in their sweet zone, right? And they never get too cold, they never get too hot. That, that uh, cooling and heating system keeps those battery packs right where they wanna be, which is another uh, big thing for temperatures down there for, for length of, uh, keeping those batteries going as long as possible. And then the final one is don't store for long periods of time. Uh, fully charged in a, in a fire truck op application, you're going to be using that truck every day, so you're really never going to have that issue either. A little bit about battery safety. Um, if you're going to open up a battery pack and start fooling around with all those bricks, remember each one of those bricks is 15, in our case, 15 volts, um, which is low voltage, right? 12 voltage is low. Everything up to 42 volts is considered low voltage, and you can, you can work around it without uh, worrying about getting, getting shocked at all. As a once, once you get above that 48, then you have to start using specialized PPE. You need to make sure your gloves are uh, in good shape. You blow them up every day to make sure that there's no blow up. I mean, by putting air, uh, air pressure in them to make sure they don't have any holes or leaks. But the only time you need that is if you're actually opening up a battery pack and going inside and starting to fool around with it. All of the maintenance and the work that's going to be done on any of these trucks is going to be done after you've pulled out the manual service desk connects out of the battery packs, which means everything in the rest of the truck, uh, any of the orange cables that carry, normally carry high voltage during, uh, during operation, they're all dead. All of that power stays within the battery packs, and so the need, there isn't any need for any special PPE in, in servicing or maintaining any of these trucks until you were to actually open up individual pa battery packs and start fooling around inside them, which isn't something that a maintenance person uh, is going to be doing. If there's a problem inside that battery pack, you know, as a manufacturer, we're just gonna send out a new battery pack and you're gonna just unbolt it, bolt it back in and then plug it in together. In our case, uh, we've partnered with Volvo Penta. So they're our high voltage supplier. So our batteries, our drive motors, our cooling units, um, and we were talking a little bit, you know, how, how much can we expect or how long can we expect our batteries to last? So right now, looking at the data um, that Volvo Penta has given us based on their buses um, and their refuse trucks and service, is what they're telling us is we can expect perhaps uh, about a one to one and a half percent of battery loss or battery degradation per year. So is what that means if we just use round numbers of 10 years. So after 10 years, best case scenario, you know, that battery when you go to plug it in is probably gonna charge to somewhere around 90%. Um, on heavy, heavy use apparatus, you know, it might be a little bit less. Um, you know, that said, you still have basically 100% performance of your vehicle. It's not like the performance is gonna be at a loss. It just really means that I'm gonna have to maybe charge it a little bit more often 
or perhaps uh, if I get on those extended operations, that diesel may kick in a little bit sooner. Um, and so then, you know, you really need to make the decision is if my battery only charges to 90%, is that good enough for my engine? And in some stations, in most stations, the answer is probably going to be, yeah, that's still fine. But you may get some departments that say, no, we want to be able to charge to 100%. Let's take that battery out and perhaps use it somewhere else. Another question that comes up a lot is, what do we do when these batteries are, um, are done and we're at, we're at whatever state of charge and we decide we're going to get rid of them? What happens to them? Two things. First off, there's a secondary they life. They go to a landfill, right? What? They go to a landfill, right? They do not. Because <laughs> okay. the that's what we hear all the time. It's going to go to a landfill. Yeah. No. So first off, we've got this, bad, this secondary life uh, thing. And, and uh, we have an uh, outfit that we work with. If, if the battery's done, they come in, they take it away, and then it goes into some other application where, um, where you want something really efficient, right, on, an, on a vehicle. But if you're just filling up a big barn, it really doesn't matter. So they can fill up barns with all of these, you know, half-life batteries, if you will, there's still a lot of storage uh, in those batteries. And so they use them to store uh, wind power, solar power, um, or they'll use them to, to buy um, power off of the grid during off-peak hours when the power is cheap, and then they'll use the power again during, uh, uh, during the on, uh, or when they need to, when the power is more expensive. If you're buying a, a, an electric apparatus, you're going to need a station, and then that station's going to have to have a dedicated charger. There are uh, two types of chargers out there, well, three types of tar chargers really out there in common use. One is the J1772 charger, and that's with an onboard AC charger. So you're, the, charge is, uh, the power is coming in as alternating current right out of the wall or either uh, you know, 120 or 240 uh, volt in, into the, onto the vehicle. The vehicle then will have a charger and it will convert the alternating current into DC current and push that into your batteries. That's that first one up there. It's lim limited to about 19.2 kilowatts. The second is the DC fast charger. Um, I have there that it's up to 150 kilowatts. Well, you can do 350, you can do you know, much higher um, amounts as well. But 150 is really the limit bef before you have to start cooling the um, uh, the cable that's going from your charger to the truck. In this case, the charger is external to the, the vehicle, right? And it's, it's turning uh, line voltage into DC current and pushing the DC current directly into the truck and directly onto the batteries. So the top portion is the AC setup plus, plus some can lines going in and out up there. And then the bottom one is the same, exactly the same plug, but we add two uh, contactors down there below, and that's what's pushing the, the, the DC voltage on. The, in both cases, the truck is communicating with the charger and let, letting it know when it should feed power and when it shouldn't. There's also a Tesla charger. So if you're a Tesla owner, you've got a different looking charger. My prediction is that we'll all end up getting rid of these and, and going with a Tesla charge plug at some point in time here. I think most of the major auto manufacturers have announced now that they're gonna start using the Tesla charger. And that's mostly, uh, all, of the, all of the charging stuff is separate. It's just that plug that we're talking about. And it's because the Tesla plug is just better designed and it's lighter weight and Tesla's got way more stations out there. So if you're, if you're GM and you're selling cars, you'd rather have uh, be able to use that Tesla charge uh, plug because now your customers can charge at more stations. So it's really um, a, a logistics thing there. And Michael will talk a lot more about this, but it, this is probably my one point on this is don't leave this to last. Um, this is very, very important. You know, we, we get through the process with some of these customers and then they realize, okay, how are we gonna charge this thing? And then they start looking at it. Um, it sometimes it's not that easy and so that's where Michael can come in and there's there are different options but do not leave the charging in the infrastructure until last you can't start soon enough on that so and there's different ways to charge um, you know right now most of the departments we're working with 
are pretty much just looking at what we call a, a portable charger. Um, you know, in this case, uh, LA is using a 50 kilowatt uh, DC fast charger. That's okay for maybe one apparatus, um, but if you are building a new station and you're looking into the future, that's probably not, well, that's not gonna be sufficient because eventually you're gonna have three to four electric vehicles in there, and so you're gonna need a much bigger system and much bigger service. You're looking at more chargers like this that potentially have some dispensers um, hanging from the ceiling where you can actually you know, charge in, in se several different bays. Regeneration, brake regeneration, as I mentioned earlier, it's very similar to what you would experience today with uh, your Jake brake or your Telma retarders. Um, there's, I think in both cases, we have different settings or levels of settings, low, medium, and high. Um, and for the most part, you can do very close to one pedal driving. I don't know if many of you have driven a Tesla before, but there you can really do one pedal driving. Uh, these EVs are kind of the same way. At least in our case, the uh, regen braking works up until about the last two to three mile an hour. Um, and then you have to use your service brakes. But when I was doing my ride along in LA, <clears throat> they took me up to the top of the Hollywood Hills. And as we were coming down, you could actually kind of watch the battery level increase. Now we only have 132 kilowatts. Um, so two to three percent on ours is, is a little bit different than what Roger has, but from the top of the hill down to the bottom, we had gained three percent of our battery back. And if you listen closely, you'll hear that regen breaking. So we're at 65, right? 67. It'll charge like Three to five percent. Yeah, yeah, just uh, so driving range variables. That's you know, I go in and do these demonstrations and presentations, and you know, one of the first questions, if not the first question, it's the second question. What's the driving range? And so, I think we really have to look at that in terms of again what a fire engine does, because we're not really concerned about range. It's not like we're driving 50, 60, 70 miles to the call. I mentioned this earlier, but, and we'll look at some data here, but you know, the average response uh, is maybe two to three miles and being on scene 15, 20, 25 minutes and then driving back. So there's a lot of things that go into it. And you know, I guess the same could really be said for a diesel. I mean, it really just depends on how you drive it, what the terrain is. Uh, and exactly what you're doing, you know, how heavy is the apparatus? So all of those things will play into range. Um, but for all of us, if you look at an application for a fire truck, we're not really concerned about it. And if we do get into those situations, that's what that backup diesel is for. Even on scene, so it's, it's kind of the same thing, but you know, you get on scene and unless you're pumping, there's very little energy draw. So. Uh, obviously, if it's hot out, we're going to be running um, the HVAC as high as we can. Uh, you know, all our warning lights and scene lights today are LED, so it's very little power draw. Communication, okay, yeah, you got your radios going and maybe your MDT. It's not taking that much energy. And then your 110 volt loads, and we were talking about this at lunch. Um, there's very few 110 volt loads on fire engines right now. How many of you are running hydraulics now? Some kind of electric, yeah, pretty much. I mean, it seems like that's where everything's going. So even on our diesel side of apparatus, um, we're seeing a huge drop off on people putting hydraulic or diesel generators on apparatus. Everything is going battery powered. So this is just a little summary of uh, uh, pumping, pumping range on electric. This is specific to the vector, um, but uh, if you were to pump for uh, that sweet spot there, the 1250 GPM from draft, um, which is what most of what we've been selling is around that 1250 GPM, uh, you could go for a 2.1 hours, which means that we can pass an, an NFPA pump test on all electric. Um, we can do what any, any pump test by running the range extender, which is, uh, is allowable by NFPA anyway. Um, so you could do a 1500 GPM flow from draft and go for, for 1.8 hours doing that. But if you look at something more, 
more useful, like usually a couple of hand lines. So let's say you got 250 uh, uh, GPM for, for one hand line, Just add another hand line, you're at 500 uh, total, and you're pumping off a hydrant, uh, that's four hours on electric only before that range extender starts to come on. Um, and in some, when I've done been to some demos that I've been to, you kind of ask, you know, like, hey, what kind of, what kind of uh, pressure do you get out of your hydrants? And you almost don't need a pumper in, in some of these cases. So the, the hotter your hydrants are, the longer you're going to be able to go on all electric. Yeah, it greatly extends the life. Um, yeah, and in most of the places that we're doing demos, same way. It's, uh, you're, on, you're on a hot hydrant system, so your, your truck really becomes a manifold at that point. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons it's a little quieter, too, because the pump doesn't have to work all that hard. If you consider a typical run, say, three miles each way, you're sitting for 45 minutes on scene um, for, for a typical EMS run, uh, you know, you can, you're going to be able to do anywhere from six to a dozen of those back to back before that range extender comes on, which, which usually is going to mean you're not going to be using the diesel at all. So I think on both of our trucks, we, you know, we all have telematics on it, so we can kind of look at some of the data, but same thing. So in the case of LA, uh, their territory is, is rather small in square miles. So uh, their typical call when we looked at the last data was about 22 minutes. Uh, 90 plus percent are, are medical or a lot of times, uh, you know, false alarms, that type of stuff. Uh, the average trip was about 3.1 miles. And I mentioned this earlier, so about eight to 12% battery consumption. So typically is what they're doing is, like I said, they're going out, they're running one, two, maybe three calls, and they're coming back and they're, they're plugging in. So, but, and as I mentioned, even if you can get a, a five, 10 minute charge in between calls, you know, that's enough to you know, potentially get 10 to 15% back in your battery. This was just uh, some of the data we pulled off the truck after a structure fire in Hollywood. So this particular incident um, was a structure fire that lasted a little over four hours. Uh, so when they left the station, their state of charge was 100%. It was a six minute response. Uh, so 2.67 miles it took them to get to the scene. So in that case, the batteries went from 100 down to 91%. Oops. Uh, they were then on this call uh, on scene for three hours and 49 minutes, of which they needed the pump for an hour and eight minutes. So in this case, um, when they engaged the pump, they went from 91% and it did drop down to 19%. So I always say 20%, but it's somewhere in that area. So at 19%, that's when my energy backup system engaged and it ran for 18 minutes. And in that 18 minutes, it went from 19% back to 52. So at that time, the call was over. Uh, it was about an eight minute drive back to the station. They went from 52 to 49%. They got back, they plugged in. Um, in this case, probably 30 minutes or so, they were back to 100%. This is kind of the, uh, the outlier, I would say. Um, if we look at the data from LA, if you remember, 98.6% of their calls have been run purely on battery power. So we believe that an electric fire truck needs to be able to respond on electric, operate on electric, pump on electric, and return all on electric. That's what the Vector can do. The motors in the Vector are capable of 500 horsepower and they're designed to be able to mimic a 500 horsepower Cummins X12 engine. So the acceleration uh, in a pumper this size is absolutely awesome. People talk about range anxiety. That's one of the things that, the, that customers often worry about. The wonderful thing about the Vector is that you can drive this on all electric for easily tw a 12 hour shift back to back without ever recharging um, it and it allow and that is because of the massive battery storage that we have on board we picked a nice quiet spot to talk about the vector and how it operates on electric only this truck is actually running right now you don't hear anything in the background, that's because it doesn't make any noise. So at the scene, with the warning lights going, the communication equipment going, 
you have no diesel noise, you have no diesel exhaust, you have no diesel heat. The Vector truly in this way is a truck of the future. Pumping on all electric with the Vector starts by stopping the truck, pulling the parking brake, the truck goes into neutral automatically, and pressing the pump switch. Now you're ready to get out of the cab and head to the pump panel. So pumping is as simple as coming back to the pump panel, hitting the pump button, and then hitting a pre-select. At this point, the pump ramps up to give us the uh, desired pressure. So we want to talk about pumping on all electric. So we're standing next to the pump panel. We got 150 PSI of pressure being provided by the pump right now on, on tank water only. So it's quiet. I can talk in a normal tone of voice. We open up the hydrant and now the pump's not having to do so much work. You can hear it get a lot quieter yet. So in a typical urban environment, when you're operating mostly on hydrant, this is a super quiet pump. Controlling the Vector all-electric pump is very easy. You can either operate it using pre-selects, 110, back up to 150, or you can control it manually using the twister or the up and down arrows. This truck can pump two hand lines at 500 GPM for four hours before the range extender comes on and keeps your batteries going. Most fire departments that I talk to say if they don't have a fire out in a half an hour, they're calling in extra equipment because it's bigger than one truck can handle. So that four hour pump range is more than adequate to deal with 99.9% .9 of what you're gonna face on a fire ground. So after we're done pumping on all electric and get all of our valves closed and hoses put away, it's just a matter of climbing back into the truck and hitting one simple switch. We're going back from pump into road. If the Vector battery state of charge drops to 15%, then the range extender comes on automatically. You get a series of beeps. The engine starts up by itself, idles for just a little bit, and then goes into generating mode. So right now this range extender is pushing 120 kilowatts of power back into the battery packs to charge them up. You can do this at any time, either manually or automatically. If you're in a situation where you definitely don't want the engine to come on, there's an inhibit function that allows you to keep the range extender from doing anything on its own. So we've shown how well the Vector can respond, operate, pump, and now return on all electric. Vector can do this 12 hours a day with no recharging in between. But if you do go back into the station between every call or every other call for about 15 minutes, the fast charger keeps you right up to 100% state of charge on the batteries. We hope that you have found this brief vector overview informative. We believe that if your department is interested in experiencing how an apparatus of the future can respond, pump, operate, and return on electric only, the Vector is an ideal apparatus to consider. Um, yeah, this is just another quick little video of uh, a ride along in LA, just really kind of show you the, the noise in the cab while responding. <laughs> Roll out.
driving. And then lastly, um, you know, kind of what are, you know, perhaps your next steps in your journey. So this is just one thing we want to point out, and I'll be the first to say this is not confirmed, um, but is what we're trying to do is set up a ride and drive at FDSOA. We're working on having all three of them there. So the RTX, the Vector, and the Volterra, so that'll give you a chance to kind of see them in operation. Um, so we're trying to pull it together. Um, it's not confirmed, but you know, stay tuned to FDSOA's website and uh, hopefully we can bring it together.